All right, so how many of you have heard of Amish before? Have you heard of... So what comes to your mind when you think of Amish? Is it like a horse and buggy? Is that what you think of? Do you think of these funny round hats with suspenders and pants that are maybe too short? Do you think of no electricity? And there's lots of things maybe that you think of when you think of, of Amish. But I wonder, have you ever thought of, of the word rumspringa? Does that even ring a bell with you? Do you know what that is? And when I was growing up, uh, there began to be a movement of Amish people to our area. And so even now today, if I go back and visit family, chances are we're going to meet at least one of these buggies on the road somewhere along that journey. And you know, they had a couple of, of grocery stores or, or things like that. So uh, they had, didn't have fancy names like Pomida or Shopco or Walmart. It was more like the Amish store. And they didn't have electricity. They had the skylights. And so you'd go through there. And it was kind of like the dent and ding and recently expired stuff. And you could go through there and get, get your groceries at a reduced price. Or you could go to the one down the street uh, on the other end of town and, and get fresh produce and, and you could get fresh milk and eggs and things like that. So pretty cool uh, things that you could do. But Rumspringa is really, a, it's a concept of, of running away, of running wild, of, of being able to pursue the worldly passions and try to figure out, does this really fit with me? Is this, is this who I want to be? Uh, so Rumspringa literally means to, to run around, the running around. And so rum, most of us know what that is. Spring, we kind of get it. And then just add an uh, and you can, you can all say that pretty easily. You can say it with me. Let's maybe even give it a try. Rum springa. Okay, good. Now, before I go too far, do we have any Amish people here today? Just one? <laughs> Jerry's being silly back there. And so we've got this, uh, this whole Amish concept of, of Rumspringer, this running around, which is more like um, teenagers when they're 14 to 16 years of age. Uh, it's a rite of passage. They, they determine at this point in life, do they want to buy into the Amish colony in the way that they do things and the church that they have, or do they want to pursue the passions of this world? And so one of the things that they do is that they give them kind of the freedom to go pursue some of these things that throughout their life they've been told are, are not good. And so modern technology, being able to, to talk on a, on a cell phone and play video games and, you know, pursue some of those other things. Some of this concept is kind of, it's, it's captured a little bit in this story, Breaking Amish. Have you seen that TV show? Like maybe even seen the commercials for Breaking Amish? It's, it's pretty far-fetched. It's not a real life story, believe that or not, reality TV not being real. But the concept is based in truth, that they really do have this thing called rumspringa, and they can go off and pursue this. They can uh, sow their wild oats, so to speak, and then determine, am I in or am I out? So they know that as teens, when they come back, they can either be baptized into the Amish church and be, be committed, or they could be just disowning of their family, of their friends, of the Amish community, and they can go pursue the world. The chances are because we're not Amish, we haven't lived that life, we haven't followed that journey, we haven't had a rum spring per se, but maybe we've, we've done a little running around, maybe we've sown a few wild oats, maybe we've chased a few things that this world has to offer because quite frankly, we're, we're longing for something more, we're, we're looking for something to satisfy our, our desires. And so we chase these things in maybe our freshman year of college. We get our own opportunities. You know, timing is our own. We can do with our time what we want. We can spend our money the way we want. We can go to the bars or, or chase the opposite sex or do whatever because there's really no parameters and I can go on a rumspringa of sorts. Uh, maybe it's like spring break. I, I didn't actually do the spring break, but I remember watching like uh, MTV spring break and seeing some of the stuff that people were doing and, you know, a chance to just get out there and and... I don't know, just chase the wild side a little bit. But it's not just all for college kids. 
Let's be honest. It happens in our teen years when we're rebelling against our parents and we're trying to pursue our own identity, but it happens maybe at another point in our life. Maybe we call that the, the midlife crisis spring up. You know, where we run off and buy something that we can't afford without telling the person that we love that we just did. Those things can get us in trouble. We know that. We know there's a challenge behind that, but we have this struggle. And if we're going to be quite honest, like along this last year's journey of Connection Christian Church, a lot of people have been brought into a relationship with God. They've been ushered into finding that way back to God. A lot of them for the first time. But many for the, the second, third, fourth, fiftieth, maybe the hundred and second time. Because we get our eyes fixed on Jesus. And we do this thing and we say, you know what, I'm all in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to work hard at it. This is, this is the, the real thing this time. Then we get busy. We get burdened. We get overwhelmed. Life happens. Kids happen. Financial burdens happen. And we get strapped down to other things. And our eyes that are supposed to be fixed on Jesus kind of wander away. And so we realize that this rum springer is not necessarily a one-time thing, but it happens over and over and over again where we drift away from God. We drift away from the church. We drift away from Scripture. We, we just constantly have this need to be drawn back. And then in life, because we're pursuing this longing that we talked about last week, the, the longing for something more. There's got to be something more. We, we began to fill that void in our life with stuff. We fill it with relationships. We, we, we fill it with money. We fill it with prominence. We fill it with getting just that right job or that right spouse or having kids. Surely this is it. This is the, the means. This is going to make me happy. This is going to bring me fulfillment. And we find out that a lot of times when we take it on ourselves and we begin to make these own choices and we begin to try to fill our own longings, we just make mistakes. And so at some point in time, after we've gotten through people upon people, friends and family members telling us that we're, we're being a bonehead and that we, we aren't listening and we're not seeing the damage around us and we just don't get it and, and we're shunning them and we're pushing them away and we're saying, this is my life, I can do with it what I want and, and it's my mistakes to make and at some point in there, we, we realize that making our own choices have left some baggage behind. Now, sometimes that baggage really is just some tough stuff. We've had to serve some time, literally, because of the mistakes we've made. We've lost friendships because of the mistakes we've made. We've lost marriages or homes or jobs because of some of the mistakes that we've made. And when we look back, we're, we're given a new awakening, and it's an awakening to regret. Have you been there? You just turn back, and you're overwhelmed by all the dumb things that you've done along the way. And the consequences that have followed that. But I've been there. My guess is, is you've been there too. Chances are, both of us, all of us, we'll be back there again someday. And regret can, can really overwhelm us. It can, it can encapsulate us. It leaves us on, a, on an island of isolation that Satan just loves. Because he can just kick us and hit us while we're down. We get to thinking that we're not good enough. And that we don't deserve it. And that there isn't an opportunity for a second chance. But the reality is we all just want to start over. We all want that mulligan where we can hit the shot again. Or if you're in my generation, you want to be able to hit the reset button on the game system. So you just want to be able to go back to the beginning and do it over. But we find out that, that many of the things that we, we say from our mouth, we, well, all of them, we can't put back. Like once they're out, they're done. Perhaps you've said some things that you regret. Maybe you meant them, but you just wasn't, you weren't very compassionate and loving when you said that. Or, or maybe you said it in a moment of stress and anxiety. Maybe you were overworked and, and overheated and you came home and somebody got in your way and bam, you just said it. And immediately you went, no. That's not who I want to be. 
It's not what I'm trying to accomplish. It's not just our words, it's our actions. Sometimes we get so bogged down by life that we, we take our, our fears and our frustrations and our anxieties out on other people. And so we're left with these moments of regret. It's a tough place to be. Well, Jesus tells us the story in Luke chapter 15. And uh, it's a story that we picked up on last week. And all through this series, we're just kind of focusing here on Luke chapter 15. If you're following along in one of the Bibles, we provide page 568. Page 568 will take you to Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to kind of summarize the beginning of this. And then we're going to pick up on verse 17, the, the spot that we're really honing in on today. So the concept here is this. You have a, a Jewish man who has two sons. And in the Jewish culture, if, if you were to pass away, you leave an inheritance. You leave your belongings to your kids. Now the youngest son, whose dad was still alive, went to his dad and said, Hey dad, give me my, my share. Give me my portion. Basically what that meant in that culture at that time was, Dad, you're dead to me. Dad, you're as good as dead. I can do this better. I want what's coming to me. I want what's mine, and I'm going to go do it my way and do my thing. Most of us have been teenagers, and we've lived a little something like this. Dad probably gave us something different than his cash. But the chances are we've, we've rebelled, and we've wanted to do things our way. And so he did, and he... He took his money and he ran off to the big city and he squandered it. He, he lost it all and a famine hit the area and, and all the food was dried up. His friends were dried up because his cash was dried up and, and nobody was around him. And he got hungry and he was looking for something more. So this uh, spoiled little brat of a man got a job because that's kind of what we do when we need money. We get a job. So his job of all things was was to feed pigs. Jewish people weren't that hip in the pigs. But as he's feeding these pigs and he's, he's dumping what I imagine these, because this is what I did when I was a kid, you dump these five gallon buckets just of slop, like everything that you didn't eat. Just like, I mean, I know it's almost lunchtime, but just, it's just, but the crazy thing is, like, in his mind he was thinking, man, these pigs are eating better than I am. And he was so hungry that he just wanted to get down and just like scoop it up. Yes, that's crazy. That's crazy. But then we pick up in, in verse 17. We're going to notice a couple of steps that this young man took on his journey to coming back to God. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. Most of us hit this, this moment in time where we've been making our own choices, doing our own thing, dealing with our own consequences, and, and we look back, in the wake of our choices is this horrible damage and the pain of regret. And so we, we generally have this moment. A light bulb goes off and something happens where we're overwhelmed with regret over the decisions that we've made and over the consequences that have flowed from those same decisions. One of the challenges are that, that most of us spend our, our time in that regret. And we go back to that island of isolation that Satan wants to trap us on. And we allow our fear and our insecurity and our hurt, and our guilt, and our frustrations to, to just embody us. They, they grab us and they suck us in. And while we're down, Satan is just sucker punching us galore. Because we're trapped in regret. But still, we get to a point where we're, we're back to longing again. There's got to be something more. I mean, there's got to be something more than, than what I was doing before, but, but all these choices I've made on my own, I just continue to mess it up, and there's got to be something else, something besides work, and something besides Facebook, and something besides Netflix to, to make life happen. And we get to this point, and struggles happen. I just wonder, have you been there? Maybe are you there now? 
You know, we can't find our way back to God until we have one of those moments and we wake up. Take a look at this video. Uh, I grew up in a, a Christian home um, with two parents who also grew up in, in Christian families. When I was young, about seven, my, my parents moved to a camp in Central Illinois, a Christian youth camp. And that was a really, really cool way to grow up, uh, just surrounded by youth groups and, and Christian kids. And coupled with that, I also grew up in the church, surrounded by a family that uh, didn't just believe it, but they lived it. You know, I had a faith. I saw how it had played out in my family's lives, but I did not have a direction and I did not have a purpose that I felt like I was being pulled towards or, or called to, just kind of searching, longing for a fulfillment that it seemed like everybody else in my family had. After, you know, searching from school to church, um, you know, the slopes of Colorado, I think I finally came down to, well, I want to pursue music in some sort, and I had a cousin in Nashville, and, I finally just said, all right, let's go, let's try it. And then I moved down to Nashville just hoping to find music or write or play or yeah, I wasn't really sure. Um, and just started bartending and waiting tables. Alongside that was, was just a, a life of partying, of pleasure, I mean, just fun. Uh, it was great, I'm not gonna lie, it was a blast. I had a lot of fun, but it's also very unhealthy. It just became continual, just meeting girls and, and drinking. By five years in, I had moments where I laughed at myself and knew, fools do this, you are living like a fool. Probably a year and a half after that, six and a half years in, uh, by that point, it was serious. It was drinking every day as soon as I get up uh, because I would have a horrible hangover and I was starting to think, this is gonna be rough, making it change at this point. You know, I think we each kind of get those moments where we just need to kind of wake up. We need to come to this re realization that, that there's gotta be something more and what we're trying to do on our own is not fixing the problem, but actually creating more damage, creating more baggage, creating more stuff, creating regret. But you know what? Today can be a day where you can, you can come to your grips and the rumspringa of your life can be over. And you can begin your journey home into the arms of God. You don't have to keep making these same decisions over and over again. You don't have to keep making these same choices and dealing with regret over and over again. There's new opportunities and new hope that comes through Jesus Christ. But, you know, there's a, there's a second step that, that this young man takes. The first was when he, when he came to himself and he realized that his dad, his dad's servants were doing better than he was doing. But the second is in verse 18. When he decides to make a choice, he doesn't just dwell in his regret because we can do that. We dwell in our regret really good. Regret can be a tool of Satan if you allow it to be. But I believe it's there by the will of God so that we awaken to his love for us. We awaken to his longing for us to come home. The party is done and it's time to return. So the young man says in verse 18 of Luke chapter 15, I will arise. I'm going to get off my duff. Pity party's over. Time to stop screwing around. Stop making my own decisions. Stop trying to fix it myself. And I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. See, the second step that the young man takes is a, is a step that oftentimes you and I, we fail to take. We can say, yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I was wrong. But regret brings with it this other R word, repentance. Not the kind that, that maybe you're thinking of like when you go down the highway and you see this doom and gloom billboard that says if you don't repent, you're going to hell. The same kind of concept, but... If we're going to be honest, it's a day-to-day -day thing because 
We look at Jesus and we get busy. We look at Jesus and we get distracted. We look at Jesus and we, we get selfish. We take our eyes, we drift away from Jesus, and we do it on a regular basis. You see, some of you, you need to come back to God. You need to find your way back to Him for the very first time. Then others of you for the hundred and first time. Because your eyes have begun to drift again. And you've got distracted by the things of this world. And you've begun to pursue those passions. And, and you found joy. And, and, and maybe it scratched an itch for a while. But, but the reality was that, that the pleasure was temporary. And the regret of past choices was deep. And you're wishing that you could just hit that start over button. That you could hit reset. And that you could go back and make things better again. Chances are, like me, you probably have a choice or two that you wish you could go back and change. You wish you had a, a relationship that you could go back and restore. But is that possible? Because Satan gets in our head and he says, no, you're not good enough. You don't deserve that. There's, there's no possible way. But I want to be here today to say that, that we've read the end of the story. We see that this young man, as he's, he's pursuing his dad, there's a, a different story taking place. And what we know is the sorry cycle that we're going to throw up on the screen that, of where we're, we're longing for something and we try to fill it ourselves and we, we end up with regret that leads us back to longing for something different. And we go back to regret and different and regret and different and regret. And sometimes for, for years, decades, we're going through the motions in this spin cycle. But I believe that God has provided Jesus Christ to put an end to the spin and to get us on the right path. And so I picture in this story the end of it. If you've been to Kansas, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you're from Kansas, I apologize early. The old man is sitting in his rocking chair. He's on the front porch. You know the style, you know the, the little white picket railing. The head is covered. And he's looking up over the, the sunset. Have you ever looked down a dark hallway and saw somebody walking towards you or away from you? And you could tell just by the way that they were walking who it was. And I could, I could picture the dad. He's, he's looking out over the sunset and he sees the silhouette of a young man. But he's, he's maybe thinking it's a mirage. He's thinking it's something a little different. He's trying to shake it off. But, but in Kansas, you can see for miles, and he's got a lot of time to think. So the young man is making his way back. And, and the dad, as he finally comes to grips with, with, this is the day I've been praying for. This is the moment I've been hoping for. This is what I've been wishing for all of my life. He sees his son coming, and he cannot contain his enthusiasm. The, the, the rocking chair that, that he's been pacing in has stopped. His feet are planted. He's looking with expectation and pretty soon he leaps up and the rocking chair is going crazy because the man is darting towards his son and as the man is getting ready to express his sorrow his dad stops him his arms are are grabbing him embracing him in this huge bear hug saying welcome home and he throws a party guys yeah, Satan, Satan wants to stick you in this in the spin cycle. And he wants to beat you when you're down and he wants to hold the regrets against you. But, but God has sent Jesus Christ, his son, to love on you and to free you and to redeem you, to, to hit the reset button and give you a chance to bust out of the cycle and to go back home. So what are you going to do with that? In a couple of weeks, we're going to give you an opportunity. We're going to do this baptism celebration. Sometimes people like to mark they're, they're milestones on their journey with different things. One of the things we do in this church is baptism. When you say, you know what? Hey, maybe I'm not perfect. I'm not right. I haven't got it all figured out. I don't even know the Bible that well. And I'm still struggling with life. And I'm still struggling with, with my identity. But what I know is that I've messed things up and I've left a regret and I need to come home. And so baptism for you is the, a place where you draw a line in the sand and you say, God, I'm in. I don't know where you're going, I don't know where you're taking me, but I'm in. And I need you to fix it because I can't. And so we ask Jesus, through the blood that he shed on the cross, he died and gave it freely for us to give us a second chance, a fresh start. 
So in two weeks, you're going to have that opportunity to participate and to be a part of this baptism celebration. But there's, there's more to it than that, too. Uh, uh, last week, we talked about this Pascal's wager. Uh, Pascal was this mathematician who was... He, he went to church, he had a religion, but he didn't really have a relationship with God until he got much older. And, and he found God, and, and as he was teaching his students, he was challenging them. It's like, here's a wager. Make a bet that there is a God who loves you. If you're right, you have everything to gain. But if you're wrong, you have nothing to lose. Guys, that sounds like a winning proposition. Make a bet that God is real. So we bet on that, and we asked you, over the next 30 days, and we've, we've passed seven of them, to pray that, that God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. We're going to add a little sentence to that this week. And I want to encourage you to continue to pray this prayer. If you, this is you on this journey, God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Awaken me to the possibility that I could start over again. Check out the second part of Jake's testimony. I was pretty functional uh, considering. Went to work and maintained this I party every night kind of attitude. And I partied openly every night so that when people would smell down me the next day, it was normal because, well, I parties every night. I was at my sister-in-law's house, uh, checking on their house. They were in South America uh, for his work and I was drinking, and I just had this totally normal moment of going, this has to stop. Like, I, I, I have to stop. I, I will die at some point from this if I don't. And I couldn't stop that night because I had to work the next three days, and I knew it's going to be ugly, and I won't, I won't be able to work. I knew after Wednesday night at work, I would have four days off in a row. So I prayed to God that night. I said, God, I need to stop drinking on Wednesday. <laughs> so please keep me safe for the next three days. So that night, Wednesday night, I went back to my sister and brother-in-law's and took my last drink and went to bed. And I would say I woke up four or five in the morning with immediate DTs. This was not a, a day later. This was hours. And I mean, I couldn't see straight, kind of hyperventilating. I'd had one before, so I knew exactly what it was. I'd had the doctor explain it to me. So that started Thursday morning, really early before the sun came up, and that just went all day, all night. Friday, all day, all night. And I should have, you know, been with a doctor, nurse, been at a rehab center, something just to make sure I was okay. But uh, as I was laying there, I just kept remembering this prayer from a book about a Celtic monk that I loved growing up. My dad introduced me to the author. The prayer that he goes to anytime he doesn't know what to do is, Lord have mercy. And it's just, he repeats it. It just becomes this meditation. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that's what I did from, from Thursday morning till Saturday, knowing the whole time and kind of laughing at myself that like, I really don't deserve this, this mercy, this grace, but asking anyway and receiving it. Saturday morning, I think the last DT was around 11 o'clock and I got up and I started drinking water and started keeping water down. And Saturday night, I finally slept, just fell asleep, crashed out and got up the next day and went to church. That was pretty much my first response. Talked to the campus pastor that Sunday morning and said, this is where I'm at, uh, what, what can I do? Who can I talk to? How can I get connected? I'm guessing we all have had those moments where we awaken to new hopes, new possibilities. But if you're not there yet, remember that prayer. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Awaken me to the possibility that with you, I can start over again. I'm going to wrap up by uh, sharing with you a story that comes from a book by Philip Yancey, a Christian author. And as we do so, the band's going to come up and they're going to uh, kind of play through this as well. 
And I want you to just kind of be, be thinking about this, meditating on this. It's like, is this something that I need to hear right now? Is this something that, that I need to be drawn into? And, and, and following this, this message time, if you want to talk, if, if this is a part of you on your journey and you need someone to talk to, I'm going to be back at Connections and I'd love to visit with you. Um, the story is of a, of a young lady. Her name is Krista. She grew up in a small town in Traverse City. It's on a cherry farm. And she had a wild, she was a wild child and she dismissed her parents as old fashioned because of the way that they responded to her piercings and her tattoos. But one night, Krista and her parents they had a huge fight. At the end of it, she slammed the door and she, she yelled, I hate you then acted on a plan that she'd been rehearsing in her mind for months. And she ran away to the big city of Detroit. And within a, a few hours of arriving in Detroit, she met a man, a man who seemed warm and nice. He, he drove the most expensive car that she had ever seen. And he was willing to take her in. And this nice man taught her a few things that would make her valuable on the streets. Because Krista was young, she brought in top dollar for her services. But as time went on and she got a little older, she wasn't bringing in top dollar anymore. And she was thrown out on the street with no money and a drug habit to support. to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain. one night is she thought back to the sunny spring days where she'd be lying beneath these cherry trees, realizing that renting her body on the streets of Detroit was no way to live. She decided she would head north. Maybe she would move to Canada and start over again. But on her way north, she, she figured she'd try something that had no chance of actually working. She mustered up enough strength to give her parents a call. No one answered, but she, she left a message telling them that she'd be passing through Traverse City on her way to Canada. And if they wanted to see her, that she'd be in the bus station around midnight. Then after hanging up, she thought leaving the message, this was, this was stupid to do because the odds were that they, they were better off, they were happier now that she was gone. And as the bus headed north, she could see the sign saying that the bus was getting closer to Traverse City. She ran through the possible scenarios in her mind and nobody would be there to meet her. Someone would be there but only to shame and condemn her. But then finally, the bus arrives in Traverse City and she heard the bus driver say, 15 minutes at this stop, 15 minutes. mental rehearsing. It didn't prepare her for what she found when she stepped out of that bus. At midnight in this small town bus depot, she walked in and found dozens of familiar faces belonging to aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents all wearing these, these silly party hats. Huge banner hanging on the wall it said, Welcome home, Krista. Then she saw her dad breaking through the crowd. He ran up to her. And she was about to explain herself. He wrapped his arms around her. 
making it clear that he really cared about her, he said, welcome home. Guys, this is where it gets real. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we awaken to our own regret. This is where we realize the longings that we've been searching for something to fill are filled only in running back to the arms of God our Father who makes it possible to hit that reset button through the blood sacrificed in His Son, Jesus Christ. One of the ways that people make this real is by just making a public profession that, yeah, I want to come back to God, and they do that through baptism. And in two weeks, we're going to have a baptism celebration. And we're, we're marking this territory now, and we're planting the seed now so that if you want to be a part of this, if you're thinking, you know, as an, as an adult, making my own decisions, I have never made this decision to make God my Father, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who saves me from all of my unrighteous, all of my regret, all of my pain, and He gives me a chance to start over. This is a moment for you. But it's also a moment where, where the Gospel promises through Acts chapter 2 that we will be given something or rather someone, the power of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in us to empower us, to do what we couldn't do on our own, to give us peace from all the past pain, and to push us on to something more. Two weeks you're going to have that chance. But it doesn't have to be two weeks. Guys, today, God is there with arms wide open, and today can be the day, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundred and first time, to search him out.